Merry Christmas. <laughs> it is so good to see you guys. And you guys look wonderful, by the way. You guys are in your Sunday best for this service. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look good this morning. <laughs> for those of you who haven't received a candle yet, we are going to be participating in our candlelight part of our service towards the end. You can raise your hand right now. We do have some junior volunteers. They'll be able to pass it around. So why don't you just keep your hands up and they'll be able to get to you. And also... We have our kids here in the sanctuary with us, so I promise not to go long. <laughs> I know how much they like to wiggle and like to be able to move. But if the kids had not received their Christmas gift from the church, we have these little glasses. They look like 3D glasses. And every Christmas light that is on the tree becomes a star of Bethlehem. It is super, super cool. So whether you are a child or a child at heart, Get yourself a pair. It's going to be very exciting. Brother David said, I want one. <laughs> if you have your Bibles this morning, why don't you open to the book of Luke? We are going to be primarily in the first half of chapter 2. If you do not have a Bible, you can use the ones in the seat back in front of you. We are going to be continuing in a series that we started a few weeks ago called Through his mother's eyes. And we have been looking at the Christmas story through Mary's perspective, remembering that God uses people. Amen? Amen? That God finishes it and he starts it, but he has human partners that he comes together with so that his plan can be able to move forward. I have a question to be able to ask you guys in light of the holiday season. I want you to ponder this. What promises do you connect with the holiday season? In other words, what can you say at the end of this phrase? I know that during the holidays, I'm going to see this. I'm going to watch this. I'm going to hear this. I'm going to feel this. Maybe it's a, a meal or a specific dish. We're having Ben Neal at the house tonight, praise God. We only have it a couple times a year now. I look forward to it every single time we get to have it. Maybe the thing that you remember is when your family says, hey, we're all going to get together for dinner at this time. And it doesn't happen until two hours afterwards. So you're in the kitchen trying to taste everything <laughs> that is getting ready to be served. Or maybe it's a tradition, like a book that you read as a family or a story. Maybe it is the Christmas story itself. In my house, we watch movies all through the month of December. And these movies are the Rankin-Bass claymation specials, like Rudolph and Santa Claus is Coming to Town. It is every single version of A Christmas Carol that you can think of, every single version. But the one that always comes to mind that I, that I get a little giddy about, it reminds me so much of my childhood, is a Charlie Brown Christmas. And everybody said amen. <laughs> the story behind it is that as Charlie Brown is preparing a Christmas play at his school, the kids are trying to remember or, or really trying to ponder what Christmas is all about. And some of them are talking about the trees and about the music and about how many wise men are in the play. Lucy is trying to figure out how to get Linus to get that blanket off of him, but he turns it into a turban so that he can become a wise man and a shepherd. But as the movie continues, you see little notes that make you ponder about the true meaning of Christmas and the true promises that are held with the holiday season. And most times, through all the pageantry, through all the music, through all the singing, through all the goodness, through all the baby crying, we've gotten our eyes off of what Christmas is all about. That Christmas is about God's promise 
to rescue mankind from sin and separation from the Father. That is the core meaning of what Christmas is all about. God beginning the part of a rescue plan that has been thousands of years in the making. It's also the completion of a promise that he gave to a young lady nine months prior to that day. And the key verse that we are going to be focusing on is a verse of the aftermath of the Christmas story. And we are going to be speaking about the story as a whole, but it all culminates in Mary's thoughts. And this is what it says in Luke 2, verse 19. It says, But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me in a word of prayer? Father God, we come before you in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this holiday season. Lord, as we take these few moments to be able to concentrate on the Christmas story, may we understand the meaning behind it. May we understand the true gift that you have given us. And Lord, most importantly, let us open that gift during this season. Many people pass it. Many people see it and admire it. But very few open it. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and more importantly, hands and feet to respond to your message. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Very simple truth today, church. God will accomplish his promises. It's that plain and simple. We've been going through the book of Luke for a few weeks now. And chapter 1 verses 26 to 38, we talked about obedience producing faith for the impossible. And how this young lady, Mary, has an encounter with this angelic being. He tells her that the Lord is going to overshadow her by the Holy Spirit and fill her womb with a child, one that will be fully God and fully man. Not only that, but that this child will be, as it says in John 1, 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory. And where you and I might say, this is impossible. This cannot happen. Logically, it cannot happen. Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled in me. Mary says yes to God, and God gives her the faith to complete her purpose in this story. And when you and I say yes to God, he begins our faith journey and gives us grace and strength to complete our mission that he has for us. Last week, we talked about how God's confirmation affirms our faith, how God gave Mary confirmation physically and prophetically to be able to complete his purpose. Because I don't know about you, but a, but a magic child, I'm going to use that phrase, a magic child f- being filled in my womb without another partner to be able to complete the process is kind of uncertain. But she goes and has a conversation with her cousin who has also received a prophetic promise from God who is already accomplishing that in Elizabeth. And through their conversation and Elizabeth's prophetic words, Mary gives praise to God and is given reassurance to trust in his plan. Similarly, God gives us reassurance naturally and supernaturally through life events and core memories so that we can have trust and faith in him. Now we are talking about 
what this is all culminating to, the completion of the promise, or what you and I call the nativity, the birth of Jesus, the completion of God's promise to Mary, and the continuation of God's promise to save his human partners and restore relationship between God and mankind. We started at the end of the story as a summary sentence for today's message, which will be formatted and shaped around Mary's part of the story, but we will also speak about God's part in this story, not just for Mary and Joseph, but ultimately his plan for you and I. But remember, God will accomplish his promises. Stay with me on that. God will accomplish his promises. And Mary sums it up for us. What happens when we see the completion of a promise? She treasures The promises. That's the first thing that she does. That's what you and I need to do, is treasure the promises. Go back with me to Luke 2, 1 through 3. Mary is preserving the chain of events leading up to this moment. And it says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Skip to me to verse 3. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Joseph and Mary take a trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem, a 90-mile trip that will have to be done over a four-day span if they hurry enough. But I don't think that they will hurry, seeing as how she is nine months pregnant. So maybe a week they are traveling down this path. And it just so happens that everyone in this census has to register in their hometown. And Joseph, being a part of David's family tree, has to go to Bethlehem, not because it's where his ancestors are from, but because it's where his immediate family is from, and he has property down there. Hear me now. Joseph had to go there for a reason, a natural reason reason but it just so happens that in the book of Micah the prophet tells us about Bethlehem but you Bethlehem Ephrathah though you are small among the uh, among the clans of Judah out of you will come for me one who will be a ruler over Israel whose origins are from of old from ancient times and we see that accomplished in just the journey of getting Joseph and Mary there, promise one is already taken care of. And then we see Mary's promise accomplished, the promise that she received from Gabriel. In 2, verses 6, in the book of Luke, it says, While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and she wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Imagine Mary's mindset while she is delivering. She's remembering this prophecy from this angel The possible shame and scrutiny of being pregnant before marriage in a community that frowns anything like it and having traveled so close to her delivery day experiencing the labor pains and the contractions and the what if they do not get there in time. Yet one, yet none of those things matter at this point. As she hears the cries, the coos, and the sounds of her baby boy. 
in this pauper delivery, this poor person's delivery room. It is a moment that she treasures, no matter the pain, the anxiety, or the suffering. She takes all of it in and puts the negative to the side because of the promise that she holds in her hand. There are plenty of things that you and I treasure like the birth of a child or grandchild. We just celebrated yesterday because uh, my brother and his wife are in, in the hospital right now as they gave birth to their first son, their youngest born, just yesterday. So we're in a moment of celebration for us as a family. But another thing that we treasure is gathering with one's friends and families during special times like Christmas and Easter, moments to be remembered, or the gifts that we will open up today. There might be some gifts that you guys are like, you got me socks again? And there are other people that were like, you got me socks again! <laughs> they were looking forward to it because they didn't want to buy their own socks. But there are other gifts, and you guys know what I am talking about, where every couple of years, all of a sudden, a family member thinks of you, especially just about you, and gets you a gift that is intentional, and you treasure that gift. You embrace it in your heart. But I wonder if you guys understand how treasured you truly are. Do you know that you are a treasured item? That you are precious, wonderfully made, and sought after more than gold and silver and precious stones? This is what it says in Psalms about you and I. It says, the psalmist says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? and human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You see, God made mankind in his image and his likeness. And since sin entered the world, the Father has had a plan in place to restore the relationship he most treasured, the relationship between him and his children. And the plans begin here. The starting point is here in this text that you are reading today. And there are some times where we forget to treasure these type of texts. Amongst the lights and the carols and the pageantry. But you are treasured of God. The next thing that Mary does that we need to do, and I've spoke to you about it already today, is that she ponders the promise. Mary has absorbed and contemplated these experiences because they are all happening at once and from different angles and perspectives. She is absorbing and thinking about not just what is happening in front of her, but what has happened to her and what is going to happen in the days to come. Can I pause for a second? Thomas Anthony, go sit down, please. You hear him? He's like, oh, I'm sorry. Sometimes we still have to be parents. Just want to take my child and ponder him. <laughs> Mary absorbs everything that she's experiencing. And not only that, it is during this time while she is taking all of it in that we see another side of the story. A side that we were talking about a few minutes ago in our introduction with the Charlie Brown on Christmas. You know, the point where Lioness starts standing up with the shepherds in their field, and he starts explaining all of this to Charlie Brown. How these angelic beings go to not royalty, 
not kings or special men or scribes, but common shepherds. To say that God's son, the promised one, has been born. And the reason why he goes to these commoners is that because though he is regal, he is here for all people. And then we see the hosts of heaven uh, heaven gather around in worship and sing songs and praise to God out in this field. They fill the sky with their songs of praise. And in Luke 2, 15 to 17, it says, When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. And Mary must have been confused somewhat. She had to ponder things because she just had this baby. There's, last time I checked, my wife has had two children. There is not a lot of faculties that happen after birth. There's like this big, oh. <laughs> She's gathering all these things together, and then all of a sudden, these shepherds, we don't know if there were three of them, but that's what the stories tell us. They're searching around in all these different houses, and they're, they're looking in, into side rooms and everything until they find this baby in the city. And she is hearing the stories of the angels and is amazed at what God is doing. And what does it say of her? She pondered these things in her heart. She knew God was in the situation and that the baby was here, yet there was still more to come. It says of Mary the same thing of what Jacob did with his son Joseph. As Joseph is, is seeing a dream of how he is going to be overseeing the rest of his family and that he is going to be placed as the head of this household as he is seeing the moon and the stars and the sun bow down to him as representation of his family. It says that his father rebukes him but that he pauses and ponders and waits for another time. You see, when you and I receive a word immediately, sometimes we don't understand it. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Sometimes we have so many more questions that we have to ask. And God is saying, why don't you just let me be me and I'll deal with the details. And ponder the things with this four-letter word we call hope. We talk about faith all the time. But hope is something that we must cherish. It is in that hope that we have trust in God. God, I don't know what is going to happen in this situation. I don't know what you have called me to fully or I don't feel like I'm equipped to handle those things. But I have hope in you. Have you pondered these things that we have talked about in your heart? Have you heard things but are on the fence about being all in? Have you heard the stories before, but truly haven't understood what it means to you in your life? Maybe you think God is a God of love, but he can't look on what I've done. He loves all people, but he can't forgive me of my mess. And I'm here to tell you this morning, you're wrong. God sees you with hope and faith as well. He ponders on your life and he looks at you 
like his child. In the same way that Mary was looking at that little baby helpless and in need of her, God looks at you as his precious child that needs relationship with him. And none of us are worthy of God's promises or his love. But God's love and mercy is a free gift. And you have probably heard it called a different thing. We call it grace. Mary treasured all of these events in her heart and saves them for a later time that she will need them. Because as the song goes, did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? That the child that you are holding is the great I am. We're going to ponder for a bit now. Because there are some of you where this is making sense. And there are some of you that need some more time. But I can't give you the answer. He has to. And that takes time in his presence. So we're doing things that are a little unconventional today. We are going to pause in the presence of God. And it's not going to be anybody else's music. It's going to be ours. We're going to sing a song together. No instruments. Just our voices as a song of praise to heaven. Elena. Would you do me a favor and get the lights in the sanctuary? 